Most of you probably know by now that I love the Resident Evil games almost as much as I love drinking myself into alcohol-induced liver failure. I've been a big fan of Capcom's spooky, atmospheric, and occasionally goofy survival horror series ever since the first one burst onto the PlayStation way back in 1996. Yeah, I'm that fucking old. The series gradually changed over the years, becoming increasingly focused on action, gunplay, and big set pieces, which is great if your idea of survival horror was Michael Bay meets Dawn of the Dead, but for fans of the older games that focused on tense atmosphere, inventory management, slow-paced exploration and problem solving, well, it was a bit like watching your daughter go off to college as a bright, fresh-faced teenager full of optimism and excitement, only to come back with a shaved head, a face full of metal, and a t-shirt politely informing you that you're literally the source of all evil in the world. She's still the same person underneath it all, but you find yourself liking her less and less. Capcom began to recognise this problem too, and produced a solution in the form of the Revelations series, a planned collection of smaller, more restrained, and slower paced Resident Evil titles designed to sit alongside the main series. I say planned because they only actually made two of them before deciding to do the same thing with Resident Evil 7, basically making Revelations a redundant concept. But never let it be said that I don't finish what I started, and since I've reviewed pretty much every other Resident Evil game, and no, I'm not going near Gun Survivor, fuck that shit, I figured it was time to take a look at Revelations 2. So grab your Jill sandwiches and let's do this shit. Resident Evil. The game picks up with series veteran Claire Redfield, who's now working for some kind of anti-bioterrorism task force named TerraSave. You've gotta love the cheesy promo video at the start. It's always a good sign when these games bring in a bit of levity. Terra save. Because tear doesn't have to end with a wrist. Anyway, Claire's attending some dull corporate reception when she runs into Moira, the teenage daughter of Barry, master of unlocking Burton. Moira seems like your typical moody asshole teenager, but read between the lines and it's pretty clear that there's a serious rift between her and her father. But before you can get fired into the Prosecco and pretend to be interested in her family dramas, a bunch of armed men suddenly crash the party and knock Claire unconscious. Sounds like your typical Scottish wedding to be honest. Claire wakes up some time later in a dull dilapidated prison cell on a remote island with no memory of how she got there. Again, see my previous comments. She soon reunites with Moira, but it turns out they're not alone here. Together, the two women have to find a way out of the ruined facility, fend off the hordes of mutated monsters that want to eat their faces, and track down the mysterious overseer who communicates with them via bracelets attached to their arms. Along the way, they run into other members of TerraSave that are trapped on the island with them, some of whom want to help, and others who have different plans. And while all this is going on, Barry Burton dusts off the cult python and heads out to rescue his estranged daughter. So it's basically the plot of every Resident Evil game ever. You're trapped in a hostile environment with lots of things that want to kill you. To escape, you're gonna have to fight, explore, solve puzzles, avoid traps, and all while managing a limited stock of weapons, ammo, and healing items. The difference here is that rather than one single cohesive story, the campaign's divided up into episodic chapters, alternating between Claire and Moira's attempts to escape the island in the present, and Barry following in their wake several months later. There's definitely good and bad aspects to that concept, but I'll talk more about that later. First up, let's look at the plot and characters. Well, for the most part, Revelations 2 actually does a pretty good job with this stuff. The intention was clearly to tell a smaller, more grounded and self-contained kind of story that harkens back back to the early days of the series, and well, that's exactly what it does. There's just enough intrigue, secrets and betrayals to keep you invested, and mostly it's pretty well paced, drip feeding you little hints and revelations, but saving the big reveals for the finale. The mystery of what happened to the inhabitants of the island, who the overseer is and what she wants with Claire and Moira is pretty fun to unravel, although fuck me, I could do without all the Franz Kafka quotes. It's pretty tough to work in high-minded philosophy like this into your game without sounding pretentious as fuck, and well, Capcom aren't up to that particular task. The flip side of the narrative comes from exploring the place several months later as Barry, which adds an extra layer of tension because you really don't know who, if anyone, made it out alive. Although I've got to admit, I was never entirely clear about what happened during those six months, or why it took Barry so long to find the island, but whatever. The point is, this isn't another mass viral outbreak that's going to destroy the entire world. It's the story of a small group of people just trying to survive. 
The tighter narrative focus and slower pace also allows more time for character development, and this is one of the strongest aspects of Revelations 2 for me. Claire and Moira are pretty well rounded as characters, and it's fun to watch their relationship develop over the course of the game. Claire's older and more experienced, and it's her job to take charge and lead the way, even though she's just as scared and clueless as her friend. You really get the sense of someone who's out of their depth, but doing their best to put on a brave face. Moira, on the other hand, is emotional and impulsive, using humour to cover her nerves and lashing out during tense moments. She's kind of rude and abrasive to begin with, and she teeters right on the edge of being obnoxious and unlikable but as the story progresses, she gradually begins to open up, and her personality softens a little. And I have to admit, by the end, she'd kinda grown on me. The two women have good chemistry together, their voice actors both do an excellent job, and it's fun listening to their banter as they work their way through the environment, trading little quips to break the tension, and swapping stories about past adventures during quieter moments. I couldn't help but smile at the little in-jokes and easter eggs peppered throughout the script. Oh my god, are you okay? Yeah, I was almost a Claire sandwich. Ugh, does Barry tell everyone that story? There's a real sense of reverence and affection for the older titles in the series, which is kind of what I'd expect with characters that have been around since the very beginning. It just feels like the game really hits that sweet spot of indulging in little moments of nostalgia without ever wallowing in it. It's also one of the few games in the series that actually acknowledges that quite a bit of time has passed since this all started. Claire's no longer the fresh-faced college student who wandered into Raccoon City 15 years earlier. She's older now, she's more mature, assertive and cynical, and she's traded in the crop tops and biker jackets for designer office wear. You've got to fucking love Barry Burton though. For one of the most iconic characters in Resident Evil lore, he's also one of the least used, and it's nice to see him get a little adventure of his own here. He's basically everyone's grumpy middle-aged dad trying to hang with the cool kids, trading bad puns and constantly bringing up that one awesome thing he did like 20 years earlier. <laughs> Who's the master of unlocking now, huh? Come on, hurry. I'll always need you. But for now, I have this. And you know what? I fucking love him for it, dad jokes and all. Never let this town change you, Barry. His goofy dialogue in the original game pretty much cemented his legacy as a walking meme. That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right. But what's interesting is that if you look past the dorky puns and gruff demeanour, there's actually a pretty compelling story about a flawed but loving father trying to make amends for past mistakes, risking everything to rescue his estranged daughter, and perhaps even finding a way to reconcile with her. It's not exactly Shakespeare, but it's a good honest bit of storytelling that I really appreciated here. It's not all fun in games though. Alex Wesker, the antagonist of the story, kind of falls victim to stage 4 Marvelitis, the process of trying to retcon in a character with supposedly deep connections to the rest of the series who for some reason nobody's ever encountered or even mentioned until now. She spends most of the game spouting weird cryptic nonsense over the radio, and when she finally does show up, she's only on screen for a few minutes before she, uh, removes herself from play. Not exactly a memorable antagonist, but in typical Resident Evil fashion, she comes back as a hideously mutated monster for the climactic showdown, only to get blown up by a rocket launcher to the fucking face. What else could you ask for? Anyway, you've listened to me prattle on about the characters and story long enough. What's this game actually like to play? Well, for the most part, it's actually really enjoyable, provided you go into it with the right expectations, which I know sounds like the kind of thing a TLJ defender would say, but bear with me on this one. I said at the beginning that the Revelations series was intended to take a step back from the action-packed mainline titles and focus more on survival horror again, giving Resident Evil purists something more in line with the classic games they fell in love with. And in that respect, it's definitely a step in the right direction. The problem is, it just doesn't go far enough. The overall pace is definitely slower, there's less focus on combat and more emphasis on exploration, environmental storytelling and problem solving. Weapons and resources are pretty scarce at times, forcing you to think carefully before getting into a fight and be as efficient as possible to conserve ammo for the big boss battles later. The partner system adds a new element to exploration and combat. Moira can use her flashlight to temporarily blind enemies, allowing her to take 
a swing at them with her crowbar and possibly knock them down for a one hit kill. She can also find hidden items which is actually a really useful ability because ammo and health is not plentiful here. Barry comes with more weapons and resources but he also has to do more fighting so the equation stays more or less the same. His partner Natalia isn't much use in combat but she can sense enemies nearby and expose their vulnerable points, saving valuable ammo or even allowing you to avoid them altogether. Basically, you're rewarded for taking the time to plan your combat strategy and properly explore your environment. Breeze through the environments too quickly or go in guns blazing and you'll quickly burn through your limited resources, making life a lot harder for yourself later. Now, generally I'm not a big fan of having two characters in a survival horror game because I think it kills that feeling of isolation and vulnerability that comes from being trapped alone in a dangerous place. But for what it's worth, I think Revelations 2 does a good job of making your partner feel like a useful asset instead of a pointless lump of meat that you have to constantly babysit. Their AI is generally solid, I never really encountered pathfinding problems or characters getting stuck on scenery. They're not much help in combat until you pump some resources into the skill tree to upgrade their performance which I know is pretty contrived, but at least it means there's a tangible advantage to using it, instead of lumbering you with a bunch of skills and abilities that you're never going to actually use. Naturally, most of the puzzles tend to focus on using two characters in the right time and place. This is definitely a lot easier if you're playing the game in co-op mode, but if not, you can still issue simple commands to your partner like stay here or follow me. They're not particularly complex or challenging and they might hold you up for a minute or two while you figure out what the game wants from you, but generally, you shouldn't have many problems figuring them out. And I have to admit, I really enjoyed the factory level. It's a nice interconnected area with multiple objectives to explore and backtrack through. Not every level is so well designed though, but I'll get to that bit shortly. Enemies tend to vary between the two campaigns, probably to avoid Barry's levels feeling like a complete retread of previous grounds. Claire's main opponents are the Afflicted, which are islanders that got infected with the T-Virus, then tortured and mutilated until they went insane and the virus activated inside them. Charming stuff. They're fast and aggressive and they can easily swarm you in large numbers, meaning that you have to pick your battles carefully. In Barry's campaign, they've since died and come back as zombies, which is a pretty neat concept to be honest, and I love how fucked up and rotten they are now. Compared to the much newer zombies in other games, these things really look like they've been decomposing for a long time. There's also the Revenants, which are a pain in the arse to take on until you figure out how to expose their weak points. Again, taking the time to plan ahead will make your life a lot easier in the long run, but probably the most annoying enemies you'll encounter are these weird floating insect things which are completely invisible and can one hit kill you if you get too close. I wasted a lot of fucking ammo trying to kill them before I realised you can kind of see their outline if you switch to Natalia, then quickly open fire with Barry before they change positions. What can I say, I'm pretty fucking stupid. Graphically, I could best describe Revelations 2 as a mixed bag. It was the last Resident Evil game to use the old MT framework engine, which was ideal for fast paced games like RE5 and 6, where you didn't really have time to scrutinise the environment too closely. It's a different story here though, where the pace is generally much slower, you're given more time to explore, and well, you start to notice things. Textures are pretty rough when you get up close, the flame effects aren't particularly good, and some of the trees look like they use single polygons to render the branches. Seriously Capcom, what the fuck? It's not 2003 anymore. On the plus side though, the dynamic lighting is pretty good, shadows generally behave like they're supposed to, and there's a really neat volumetric fog effect that looks way better than it should for a game like this. Character models are generally pretty detailed and expressive, and the animations are fluid and realistic. Fuck knows what's going on with Claire's face though, I love how she doesn't even vaguely resemble any previous version of Claire. The environments are generally quite atmospheric and fun to explore. There was a clear attempt to emulate the look and feel of abandoned Soviet cities like Pripyat, lots of dilapidated apartment blocks, ruined factories and rusting industrial centres, but there's also misty forests, windswept beaches and desolate cliff tops. There's a decent mix of places to explore with different enemies and strategies depending on the situation, and I appreciate the subtle storytelling at work here, the little notes and journal entries showing a dying community initially welcoming an outside presence, only to slowly realise they're being used for something much more sinister. That being said, I can't say any of these places are so interesting that I needed to see them twice, and that's where the game starts to grate on me. Basically, when you've completed each chapter as Claire and Moira, you then have to replay that section as Barry several months later, which essentially involves you going through the same exact fucking levels as before. Now to be fair, the two campaigns do diverge a bit more later, and they each get their own unique areas to work through, but it still feels like a cheap excuse to reuse the same areas and spin out what I guess were pretty limited 
development resources. The other issue is that the game is mostly still locked into the same linear level design that's been around since Resident Evil 4. The older games gave you nice interconnected maps like the mansion or the police station, and you had to do a lot of backtracking and navigation to find key items and take them where they needed to go. Even if you progressed a fair way into the game, there was usually still a way to get back to earlier areas if you wanted to have another look around. Now it's mostly just a case of getting from one end of the map to the other so you can exit the chapter, and it just feels cheap and simplistic. Like, imagine how much cooler this game would be if you had to backtrack to different parts of the island, maybe to unlock key areas that were sealed off before, or find hidden items that were impossible to reach. Maybe that would give the devs a better justification for reusing the same areas. I guess my biggest complaint with Revelations 2 is that while it takes little steps in the right direction, it doesn't really have the balls to commit to its objective. It wants to take the series back to its roots, but it's so afraid to stray away from that lucrative RE4 comfort zone that it ends up delivering an unhappy compromise that pleases nobody. The linear progression, anemic puzzles, lack of inventory management and heavier combat sections aren't going to appeal to fans of the older titles, while the slower pace and smaller scale is probably going to turn off fans of the big bombastic excesses of the later titles. Ultimately, all of this became kind of a moot point with the release of Resident Evil 7 anyway, which did everything the Revelations series had set out to do only much better, bringing the series full circle and completing the journey begun by these smaller, less ambitious and less sophisticated games, leaving the Revelations series as kind of a footnote in Resident Evil history, a tentative step down an aborted path destined to be overshadowed and forgotten by its bigger brothers. And it's a shame really, because despite its flaws and shortcomings, despite all the bad things I've pointed out here, I actually found this game pretty damn fun to replay. I went into my playthrough expecting it to be some dated, clunky relic of a different generation, but for the most part I was pleasantly surprised by how well-paced, atmospheric, engaging, and downright fun it was. I found myself tensing up as the next encounter loomed. I was excited to explore the next area that opened up. I smiled at the little in-jokes and callbacks, and by the time the credits rolled, I felt like I'd gone on a satisfying little adventure. Revelations 2 may not be a landmark title in the series, and I'd be lying if I said it was one of my favourites to replay, but it's still a fun, well put together little game that pays a lot of respect to Resident Evil's long history while telling a pretty engaging story all of its own. And the fact that I've spent so long prattling on about it here suggests that maybe, just maybe, it perhaps deserves a little more recognition than it gets. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.